Good morning. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in us. I'm so happy to see you all here. Um, it's been a big weekend, and thank you for coming and uh, showing your smiling faces. I am going to ask Mike to talk a little bit about mission. You've unleashed a monster here, so. <laughs> Now, 
Um, and he put the directory in the back of it too, which is woefully um, inaccurate. So we'll be, it's a work in progress, the living, breathing document. So we're going to be working on that um, as we go along. But it has opportunities for the, for the um, through the rest of this year, and then another one will be coming up at the end of December. So please submit um, any, any points of interest that you want to put in, to make sure that this um, booklet is up to date and um, all the offerings are in here. The other thing about this, though, is the ones that he printed out are black and white. They're very dull. I have a colored one, and he said he will print out a colored one for anybody who would like it for a mere donation of $5, which will be put to the 50th, um, I almost want to say 50th wedding anniversary, the 50th <laughs> <laughs> anniversary um, uh, celebration that's going to be happening this summer. So if you would like a $5 version, which is very beautiful, and you just want to look at it all the time, um, uh, just put a little note at $5 on Al's desk and he'll print you up for him. Get that to you. Um, and then the last point of interest for right now that I wanted to highlight is that that um, Karen Robinson's mom passed away yesterday. And um, she wanted everybody to know that uh, the funeral is going to be Monday, November 5th, 11 o'clock at Lakeside Presbyterian, and all are invited. So, so there's that. All right, now with all that being said, please stand for our gathering song, oh, 4,000 times to sing. <laughs>
join me in our prayer of confession. We confess that we find your medicine hard to swallow. The quick fixes of this world are so much more pleasant, leaving us free to go back to our usual routines. When your medicine is powerful, and if we take it, it will remain and renew our lives. It will reorient us to you and to you alone. The God of our salvation, the God who weeps for us and for our world, desires everyone to be saved. Jesus Christ, a human like us, gave himself as a ransom for all. <laughs> Through the love of the one God and the one mediator, we are forgiven. Kids, you want to come up front? Exactly right. I didn't do that last night, and I. And you have 
You know, actually, that was what she did. You gotta find it. Cool. You gotta find it. Oh. Uh, the better thing out of the back of the video, turn it up. And the better thing you can go around and do whatever you're doing. Right. There is a proper order of these things, right? All right. So now we come to our money. Our scripture lesson this 
morning comes from the book of Luke, chapter 16, verses 1 through 13. Jesus said to his disciples, there was once a rich man who had a manager. He got reports that the manager had been taken advantage of his position by running up huge personal expenses. So he called him in and he said, what's this I hear about you? You're fired. And I want a complete audit of your books. The manager said to himself, what am I going to do? I've lost my job as a manager. I'm not strong enough for a laboring job, and I'm too proud to beg. Ah, I've got a plan. Here's what I'll do. Then when I turn out onto the street, people will take me into their houses. Then he went at it, one after another. He called the people who were in debt to his master. He said to the first, how much do you owe my master? He replied, a hundred jugs of olive oil, olive oil. The manager said, here, take your bill, sit down here, and quick, write 50. To the next he said, and you, what do you owe? He answered, a hundred sacks of wheat. He said, take your bill, write in 80. Now here's a surprise. The master praised the crooked manager, and why? because he knew how to look after himself. Streetwise people are smarter in this regard than low-abiding citizens. They are on constant alert, looking for angles, surviving by their wits. I want you to be smart in the same way, but for what is right, using every adversity to stimulate you to, to create a survival to concentrate your attention on the bare essentials so you'll live, you'll really live and not complacently just get by on good behavior. Jesus went on to make these comments. If you're honest in small things, you'll be honest in big things. If you're a crook in small things, you're going to be a crook in big things. If you're not honest in small jobs, who will put you in charge of the store? No worker can serve two bosses. He'll either hate the first and love the second, or adore the first and despise the second. You can't serve both God and the bank. So as the reading of God's word, as interpreted by Eugene Peterson in the message. During the financial crash 10 years ago, so many people were affected with loss of income, <coughs> loss of jobs, loss of, loss of investments. Just after the crash happened, my childhood friend Jean called me and she, her husband had just retired at age 54 and she was sobbing because their investments had practically overnight been cut in half. Their dream of a comfortable retirement had to be seriously readjusted. And now here we are 10 years later and those memories for them and all of us who had experienced that trauma has lasting effect on how we view our thinking about our finances. For most of us, the Result of this has been anxiety, to say the least. Will I have enough money? Will my job be affected? Will I lose my home? What will happen if I'm bankrupt by an illness? Will I be able to send my, my children to college? Anxiety about these things can have a serious dampening effect upon our lives. And that sends us into a mindset of scarcity rather than abundance. And I'm gonna do a little bit of self-disclosure right now about uh, um, what happened to me and Mike. Um, within a couple of years of each other, we both lost um, really well-paying jobs. We went from one tax bracket crashing down into the basement of all tax brackets. We have always tithed to the church, and when it was obvious that we couldn't give at the level that we'd been giving, 
we got a call from the pastor, the finance people, and somebody else wondering if we were going to be able to fulfill our estimate of giving that we had. And oh, oh and by the way, in that time too, we um, I, I got a diagnosis of cancer. So you know, it was like throwing, throwing it all in. It was scary. And yet we trusted God, who had a gigantic plan for us. Meanwhile, here at church, we are sometimes accused of not being connected to the real world and real concerns, such as financial concerns. And I get that. And yet I can give a personal testimony that not giving to the church, and by the way, we did fulfill our, our um, giving through that year, not giving to the church isn't going to improve our finances. It didn't affect us one little bit. And I just want to share that with you, that not giving is not going to improve finances. So Jesus had a sharp eye on both material, the material world and the spiritual world, and was constantly alerting his disciples to connections between the two. And that's the case with today's parable of the shrewd manager, which has been called the most confusing parable Jesus ever told. Was Jesus really commending the dishonest actions of his manager? Exactly what are you trying to tell us here, Jesus? It's interesting to note that in church, we seem to focus on spiritual things. And in, the, in Luke's gospel, it's surprising to realize how much time Jesus spends talking about material things. Like wealth, and like money, and their consequences on our lives. Clearly, Luke understands that the issues of wealth and poverty are very, very complex. That anxiety about money is a disease shared by those who have it and by those who don't have it. And that a generous sharing of one's goods can free us from the danger to the soul which brings such things. Luke understands that not only prosperity, but also poverty casts a shadow over life. And therefore, it is the poor who are the objects of God's special concerns. Luke's version of the parable of the shrewd manager and the parable of the rich man um, and Lazarus represents first a positive and then a negative use of money and material things. Both parables begin this way. There was a rich man. How about we modernize that parable of the shrewd manager? How about this? There was a CEO, chief executive officer, whose CFO, the chief financial officer, badly managed company finances. So the CEO says to the CFO, your performance has been pathetic, perhaps even criminally negligent. Turn in your ID and your keys and clean up your desk by five o'clock. Well, the CFO panicked. She was too old to look for a new job, she was too young to retire, and she had too much pride to apply for unemployment. What was she to do? Well, she had this wicked idea. She called accounts receivable and picked three customers, most behind in their payments. She called the first and said, look, we're anxious here to get this debt off our books. If you can pay by the 15th, I'll give you a 25% reduction to your liability. To the second, she said, look, we're conducting an internal audit and come across some errors in your favor. What do your records show you all? $50,000. Well, our records say $40,000. If you can pay that, we'll call it even. 
to the third she said a shipping error has happened. We just discovered this and have reduced your debt by one third. Oh, and at the close of each conversation, she casually remarked that she planned to leave her present position soon and, and hoped that they would keep her in mind. So the later that day, she walked out of the office for the last time with her reduced pension benefits, no health insurance, and a paltry amount of severance pay. But there was a smile on her face. Within a month, she was hired as a consultant by each of the firms she had called that day. In fact, not long after that, she ran into her old boss at the yacht club. She turned to leave, but he caught up with her, and he put his arm around her shoulder and said, I've got to hand it to you. You can shoot pool with the big boys and the best of us. I couldn't have come up with a better scheme myself. The end. So there you go, that was a great story, right? But if you're not sure what to make of this parable, take comfort in the fact that perhaps Luke didn't know either. And yet, what if, what if, Jesus is making an ironic comparison that there are two scoundrels who spend their time and their energy scheming to ensure their own comfort and security and Jesus is laying down that idea of, if only my followers would be that shrewd, that creatively reckless, that single-minded single -minded in serving me. Surely the followers of Jesus put into following Jesus and serving others, the energy of fighting each other and building their own kingdoms well, by now, we would have cured cancer and ended hunger and established world peace and brought the kingdom of God to earth. Is Jesus saying to us, as he seems to be saying to them, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, we've got to do better and we've got to work smarter, even learning as we can from the ways of the world, except for the cause of good rather than evil, others rather than ourselves. Can we do it? Well, there's a TED Talk. I don't know how many of you are familiar with TED Talks, but I kind of get sucked into them every once in a while. I came across this TED Talk about charitable giving. And charitable giving, uh, of course, also includes the church. And that for the last 50 years of giving, charitable giving has been stuck at 2% of the US GDP, the gross domestic product. In a world of increasing demands and fiscal belt tightening, where government is stepping back from social programs, and let's face it, 2% is not going to cut it. So in this TED Talk, entrepreneur, author, and humanitarian activist Dave Pallotta asks, could it be that everything we've been taught about charity, about giving, and about making a change in this world is backwards? Pallotta created such multi-day charitable events as the long distance three-day um, breast cancer walks, the AIDS ride, bicycle journeys and the out of the darkness suicide prevention walks. Pilata asks, how would you react if you knew that someone was getting wealthy in charity? How would you feel if you saw your favorite charity run a $3 million ad on a Super, on a Super Bowl using charitable donations to fund it? What would you think if a charity lost a million dollars on a new fundraising night activity that walked? And lastly, what if you learned that a charity had just paid an investment a 100% return on a loan? Aren't these kinds of scenarios the kind that make us mad? The kinds of practices that give charities a bad name? But what if we're wrong? What if the things we think are wrong are actually the things 
that will take, it will take to end humanity's most vexing and extreme forms of suffering. Suppose that a person getting wealthy in charity was actually worth it. What if the Boys and Girls Clubs hired a leader who gets a total compensation package of $1 million annually, who triples the re revenue again in eight years from half a billion dollars annually to $1.5 billion annually, which allows the club to double the number of kids that they serve? Well, that actually happened. And the Boys and the Girls Clubs were criticized extensively for it. What if the $3 million Super Bowl ad brings in $6 million in new revenues from just the first showing, and another $6 million in gifts over time from new donors who repeat their gifts? The charity turned each original donor's dollars into $4. What if the $1 million lost on a charity fundraiser that flopped taught the charity something they never knew? That allowed them to create a new fundraiser that then in turn raised millions of dollars. That would mean that the donors that funded the loss were actually funding an investment in learning that reaped millions. As for the investor getting a 100% return on a loan, what if the loan was to finance a new and a risky fundraising idea? The charity needs a million dollars to cover the upfront cost to launch it, but it's risky. It's never been done before. It could fail. No bank will touch it. So an investor comes along and says, I'll put up the million, but I want two million back if it succeeds to compensate me for the risk of losing my money. The charity agrees. The event is a huge success, netting ten million dollars the first year. The investor gets two million, leaving eight million for the cause. A figure that would have been zero without the investor. Now, because the concept is proven, banks are willing to finance the, the event in the future, in future years, at a lower interest rate. The event nets eight million dollars a year for ten years. That's eighty million dollars total, all for the tiny cost of one million dollars paid to the original investor. Now, all of these are true stories, and I would encourage you to pull up that TED Talk and to watch the whole thing in entirety. It's really fascinating. So when you hear the whole story, suddenly it seems unconscionable and not to do the things that we've been taught it would be unconscionable to do. We allow the for-profit sectors to feast on the tools of capitalism while we deny those tools to the nonprofit sector in the name of charity. If we take responsibility for the thinking that it has been handed down to us, we revisit it and we revise it. We could change our whole approach to changing the world. And then, says Glenna, things could really begin to change. Jesus says, I want you to be smart in that same way. But for what is right, using every adversity to stimu stimulate you to creative survival, to concentrate your attention on the bare essentials so you'll live, really live, and not complacently just get by on good behavior. Can we do that? Instead of just letting money and material things weigh us down, can we think differently about them, about the way we fund church, per se, about the way we give and the way we raise money for the sake of God and for good. In the parable of the shrewd manager, isn't this exactly what Jesus is asking of us? I'm going to say amen to that idea. And now, if you will all rise,
for some response. Here I am. So, prayers of joy 
excited for all the athletes here in Two Harbors. Um, Cedar and Lamar are going to be taking their team to state for cross country running and for um, the, our football team who's going to be moving on to the next level. So proud. Lord, in your mercy. Yes, Right, the, um, the variety show on Thursday, is that what you're talking about? Okay, the variety show on, on Thursday was amazing. The musicians in this, I, I have not been a, a non-talented person yet in Two Harbors, whether it's music or sports or just, you know, playing a good person. Um, so yes, it was amazing. Lord, in your mercy.
faithful for. Our tithes and our gifts and our offerings may seem little in comparison to God and to us, but we are called to be faithful over all that we have, our time, our talents, our gifts, and our service. When we give of ourselves, we practice the spiritual discipline of stewardship. When we are faithful over a few things in this life and the life to come, we may be faithful over much, much more. May God bless us in our giving, that God's kingdom may be here with us on earth. The ushers will now pass the place to collect our morning's offerings.